Hi, I'm Corey Plasek, joined by Mark Phelan and Emily Ross, students at Vanderbilt University, taking a class called CS282, an in-depth analysis of Web 2.0 technologies and their impact on society. Today we're talking about a Wired article first posted November 20th, 2009, titled, Writer Evan Ratliff Tries to Vanish. Here's what happened. In it, Evan Ratliff chronicles the attempt to disappear for a month and start a new identity. His experiment was inspired by an earlier article he written in August 2009 describing how Matthew Allen Shepard, a 42-year-old environmental health and safety manager for electrical parts maker Eaton, tried to disappear in February 2008. Ultimately, Matthew's attempt failed, but it sparked the idea for a manhunt with a $5,000 bounty placed on Evan's head by Wired Magazine. Readers of Wired Magazine and an online blog were provided with information regarding his disappearance, and the hunt was on. Evan's experiment brings up an important question. Why would someone want to disappear? Primarily, Evan mentions that people could feel overwhelmed with their current situation, possibly with criminal or financial trouble. There's also the, el the element of a lure to discarding everything about your identity and starting a completely new one. Vanishing at any other time earlier in history might have been a relatively simple affair, but technology has a profound impact on finding people. Evan set off on his disappearance to answer a chilling question. In this digital age, how difficult is it to vanish? Before his disappearance, Evan prepared for months. He created a new identity, creating a fake company, fake name, and business cards to match. Evan had dozens of email addresses written down in a notebook he carried with him. He allowed his hair and beard to grow out so that he could completely change his appearance when he disappeared. Evan even got his motorcycle license in case it would prove useful. Evan bought prepaid cell phones, gift cards, and credit cards with cash that he saved over months in a hollowed out book in preparations for his disappearance. When it came time to disappear, however, nothing could mentally prepare him to assume the role of his new identity, James Donald Gatz. On August 13th, Evan Ratliff started out leaving San Francisco on I-80, headed to Las Vegas, Nevada. When he arrived in Vegas, he rented an office where he set up two computers and a webcam and then left. He sold his Civic, dyed his hair black, and put in hazel contacts and prescriptionless Harry Potter glasses and then left for Las Vegas Greyhound Station. On August 16th, under the false name James Gatz, Evan hopped a bus to Venice Beach, California. In Venice, he checked into an apartment and got comfortable. He logged in remotely to his computer in Vegas and used Tor to browse the web. After five days in Los Angeles, Evan was ready to leave. As a diversion, Evan used his credit card and ATM card in Santa Monica before heading east with a band called the Hermit Thrushes. Evan spent the next five days touring around the middle of the country with the band, using his Virgin Mobile broadband card to access the internet. On the road, he created a new Facebook account and a Twitter account for his new identity. Then on August 26th, he left the band in St. Louis. From St. Louis, Ratliff took a bus to Carbondale, Illinois, where he caught a train to New Orleans. He booked online using his middle name and he misspelled his last name. In New Orleans, he rented an apartment under the name J.D. Gatz using PayPal gift cards and a fake business card for ID. He then proceeded to get comfortable again and set up his new life in New Orleans. On September 5th, he took a train to Memphis, where he used his real ID to fly from Memphis to Salt Lake City for the U.S. World Cup match against El Salvador. He bought fake tickets from L.A. To, and Portland to Salt Lake City for September 4th to confuse those hunting him. On September 6th, he caught a flight to Atlanta, where he almost got caught, but thankfully he had logged into his computer in that terminal and noticed someone was staking out the airport. He was able to slip out through the back exit undetected. After crashing at a friend's on September 7th, Evan caught an Amtrak to New Orleans where he increased his effort to make friends. He also decided to make his Twitter feed public and subscribe to several feeds of interest to his new life in New Orleans. On September 8th, his last day, Wired decided to offer Evan a few challenges as a chance to earn some cash. Evan took them and as a result had to attend a book reading which was hidden for the hunters in a New York Times crossword puzzle. Taking that challenge proved to be the worst decision Evan Ratliff or J.D. Gatz could have made, for outside the book reading, local hunters caught him. Dun dun dun! So, why were people interested in finding Evan? Within a week of Wired announcing the hunt for Evan, more than a thousand people wanted to find him. Some wanted the bounty, while others gave chase simply for the challenge of the hunt and to find out if it was possible to truly disappear in our digital age. How did the hunters go about finding Evan? First, they dug up all the information they could find on him. This included accessing his bank accounts, credit cards, ATM records, past addresses, medical history, cell phone records, and transportation records. Nothing was secret from the hunters. Then they shared the information online. They posted it to the Wired blog and on Twitter. They started Facebook groups and sent emails. 
They talked on secure chat rooms to try and keep Evan in the dark about their plans. They searched Flickr for pictures of him and then photoshopped them to see possible disguises. Then they used Google Earth to try and build maps of his possible routes across the country. Then the hunters did physical location stakeouts. Many hunters would go to places that they thought Evan would be and just look for him to try and catch him. When a hunter thought they knew what city he was in, they'd start calling restaurants and other businesses to ask if the owners had seen him. A big stakeout location was at airports when Evan moved locations and the U.S. World Cup soccer game because they knew he was going to be there. In the end, it was a stakeout at the book club gathering that would get Evan captured. So, who were the primary hunters? The most effective hunter was Jeff Reifman, who created a Facebook app dedicated to information and discussion about Ratliff. He created a tool to pick out the IP addresses of Facebook visitors to this app, and when Evan did visit the site, he was the guy without many friends, and it led Riffman to find Evan's Twitter account and eventually led him to New Orleans. The other main hunters were Jeff Leach and Fillinger, co-founders of Naked Pizza, a gluten-free restaurant in New Orleans where Evan visited. They were contacted by Reefman and agreed to stake out the book club gathering near their store. They were the ones who actually caught Evan. Why did Evan get caught? In the end, Evan's digital footprint was too deep for him to erase. To answer Evan's original question, is it possible for someone with enough discipline and resources to completely vanish from one life and start another? Evan simply could have stayed at a remote location for a month, but that wasn't the object of the experiment. Evan wanted to see if he could leave his old identity behind and start a new one while still being himself. This leaves only one important question. How much are you willing to give up to vanish?